Unit 8, Part 2, as I was saying towards the end of Part 1, uh, our replacement rules, our Unit 8 rules, are rules presenting us with uh, pairs of formulas. The, this is the inside cover of your book again. Um, that's the list of all the rules. And the pairs of formulas separated by that replacement sign, that's the two double dots, the left-hand side and the right-hand side stand in relation of logical equivalence, not just logical implication, like Unit 7. And since it's a relation of logical equivalence between left-hand side statement form and right-hand side statement form, since it's a relation of logical, implica uh, logical equivalence, there's two more things you can do. You can move from an instance of the right-hand side to a movement to, to an instance of the left-hand side of the rule as you do a proof. Right? So if you're presented with an instance of, this is going to be a, a, an instance of contrap, contrap. This is an instance of the right-hand side of the rule, and you're moving to an instance of the left-hand side of the rule, right? citing as the rule contrap. Right? You can cite as the justification for the move contrap, moving from a right-hand side to a left-hand side. And the second thing you're allowed to do, also illustrated in this example, is you can use them on subformulas. Okay, so. You certainly can't do that with the rules of inference, as I explained in part one, and have spoken of it in previous parts. Um, but you can you can do so here. You can move from you, you can apply the rules merely to subformulas, right? <coughs> Excuse me. Can't do that for the rules of inference. Think about simplification. Um, uh, so let me just explain a bit more clearly why the fact that the, the two statement forms stand in relation of logical equivalence, why that justifies um, your, why that justifies you in using these rules on subformulas. Um, well, again, it's return to the notion of truth functionality, okay? Um, Okay, so all our formulas are truth functional. This is a truth functional system of logic. Uh, what we're concerned with, right, we're now doing proofs, but we're still concerned with truth preservation, right? Where we're, we want to make sure, and I'm now trying to explain why these replacement rules allowing replacement of subformulas, um, why it is always truth preserving, well, um, this formula, right, what we, the only thing we really care about it is whether it's true or false, right? For each formula, we really only care whether it's true or false. We want to make sure that if our premises are true, our conclusion is also true. Um, so that's all that matters for truth preservation is the truth or falsity of the premises. Well, this is the subformula I'm going to, this is the subformula I'm going to replace. So the rule of contra, um, Given a conditional, you can reverse the antecedent and consequent, adding a negation to each side, or removing a negation from each side, going from right to left. Let me swap them around. Um, so this is an application of contra. Think about why it's valid. Well, what role does this formula play in determining the truth value of the formula as a whole? Right? The formula as a whole is this um, disjunction, right? It's a wedge, okay? The only thing that goes into, the only role this subformula plays in determining the truth value of the formula is the truth value of that formula. I'm putting it in a different color, T, to indicate that I'm, this refers to the truth value, T, right? If you just saw this formula with a, a white T there, you'd think T is another statement, right? A statement constant referring to an individual sentence. Now I mean the truth value, right? So if I'm computing the, tr if I was computing the truth value of B and D or this, it would be, you know, if this is true, then, uh, then that would make, that would make the disjunction true, right? Well, since it's a relation of logical equivalence, right, that is, Whenever the first formula that I just erased, whenever that's true, this is true, right? So it always plays exactly the same role, right? right? Whatever I replace it with, the only thing that goes into determining the truth value of the whole thing is exactly the same, 
That is, the truth value of that, whatever it is, true or false, the particular formula I erased, is the truth value of this formula I replace it with. And this is true generally for all the replacement rules because the relation between the left-hand side and the right-hand side is always a relation of logical equivalence. Okay? Or if it's the case that this formula was false, right? If this was false, right? The role that that sub, sub formula would play in determining the truth value of the whole thing, well, that's false. So that means, right? If this is true, the disjunction is true. But if this just dis, if, so the if the conjunction is true, the disjunction, the formula as a whole is true. If the conjunction is false, then false or false, that would be false, right? But if that original formula that I erased, erased was false, then every logical equivalent formula I replace it with is also false, right? Okay. So you're just, the only thing that goes for every formula, so for, for every sub-formula of every, of every formula, for every sub-formula of every formula, the only thing about that sub-formula that goes into determining the truth value of the formula as a whole is the truth value of that sub-formula. Now, when you're applying a replacement rule, right, you're replacing one logically equivalent formula with another, which means the only thing that goes into determining the truth value, the only thing that, about that sub-formula that goes into the determining or affecting the truth value of the whole thing is exactly the same, right? You're always replacing a false formula with another false formula when you're replacing it with a logically equivalent formula, or you're always replacing a true, true formula with another true formula if you're replacing it with a logically equivalent formula, okay? So you're always replacing a false for a false, or a true for a true. So, um, so whenever this is true, this is true. Whenever the whole thing is false, the whole thing is false. Okay. Uh, moving on, let me say just uh, again, I'm very much uh, the teaching for Unit Eight. Very much assuming you've read through it, right? I'm not going to speak of about all the rules. I'm not going to introduce them as much as Clank is. Read through Clank on your own. Be introduced to the rules by yourself. But I'll just make a few remarks on them, uh, on some of them. Uh, double negation. Okay, double negation, that's the rule formally presented. Uh, I forget, do two dots. Double negation, you can replace any formula with its double negation, right? Again, so just let me point out a few applications of double negation, right? Again, learning, just like Unit 7, learning all these rules is very much um, learning how they can be applied, right? where they can be applied, thinking what possible moves you can do with them. Right? And as, as we'll see when we do a few exercises, um, you need to have in mind um, when you actually, when will you be using the rules? You'll be using the rules when it furthers your uh, progress towards the conclusion, when you're actually doing proofs. So um, I'll have a look in a moment at uh, page 152, A from 152, and I'll talk when we look a bit at it. But the use of the full, the use there illustrated of the few rules she's introduced is um, geared towards a certain end, geared towards getting the conclusion, and she's using those rules in that situation because they help her to get to that um, conclusion. Anyway, so double negation, right? If I have if I'm given a hook B, look at the look at these several uses of double negation. Um, any formula you can add a negation to. It can be used on subformulas, right? And you can go from right to left. Uh, here I can't go from right to left because I don't have any double negations. Nothing here is in the form of a double negation. But right, I can go from left to right like in in three different ways already. Right, I can double negate the whole thing. By right, justification, double negation, number one. Right, is that legal? Yes, that is a P. That is a hook P. A hook B is an instance of P. Why? It's just it is a valid formula. It is a legal formula. I've double negated it. Right, that's a move from P to not P. But so is this. Right, how about not not a hook B? 
So I think double negation, right? That's also a valid use of the rule. What have I done here? I've simply taken the subformula A as my P and I'm applying double negation to the subformula. I've replaced A, right, this is double negation from one. Um, right. So be clear on that, it's double negation from one. I can't go from two to three, that's not legal. But I can go from one to three by um, double negation. I've just replaced the subformula A with not not A. That's moving from a P to a not to a not not P. Or of course I can go A hook not not B. Also double negation on one. Right. It's another legal move. Right. Just replacing a formula, um, replacing a subformula with its logically equivalent formula. That's what I'm doing. And every time I apply a, re a replacement rule. I'm replacing a formula with its logically equivalent formula. Here, I've, here and here, I've, three and four, I've done that for those subformulas. How about this? Um, if this is my one, if this is, if I'm given not, so how do you read this? This is the negation of a disjunction, right? This is, it is not the case that either not A or B. No, you could not use double negation on this, okay? Be careful for that. Um, you cannot use it when it's separated by brackets. You have to have, right? So it wouldn't be, it would not be correct to go A or B, right? Do a truth table, test these out, you'll find these are not logically equivalent formulas, all right, at all. That's not legal, that's, um, right? So you gotta have, if you're moving from a right-hand side to the left-hand side, the two tildes have to be contiguous, not separated by any parentheses.